Hello everyone. Today I'm taking a break from nutrition to talk about a more clinical topic, which is pulmonary vasodilator drugs. To start, I'm an intensive care trainee based in Australia. I do not have any financial conflicts of interest with drugs, devices, books, or anything else. This is designed to help me revise for my CICM primary exam and hopefully share some conceptual knowledge with others. I was inspired to cover this topic after seeing a large cluster of massive and submassive pulmonary emboli admitted to our unit as well as thinking about management options for severe hypoxia when you don't work in an ECMO centre. So this video is going to be about the neglected half of cardiovascular physiology, the pulmonary circulation and the right heart. I'm going to talk a lot about a rare and horrible disease called pulmonary hypertension, although it might not be as rare as you think. We'll go over some hemodynamics with a focus on the pulmonary vascular resistance. We'll see how the pulmonary and the systemic circulations differ and we'll learn about the right ventricular death spiral. I'll talk about some of the values that you might see at right heart catheterization and how that's used to diagnose and classify pulmonary hypertension. And after that, we'll talk about how vascular smooth muscle actually contracts, how the endothelial cells are involved, and how all of this goes wrong in pulmonary hypertension. We'll talk about the principles of pulmonary hypertension management and some of the drugs involved. And finally, we'll talk about how to manage these patients once they crash and come to ICU. I'll also do some specific discussion on inhaled therapies, as well as other causes of right heart failure in the ICU. I'm not going to talk very much about neonatology, congenital heart disease or cardiac surgical patients, as those are whole other topics, although some of the principles will overlap. Final disclaimer. I'm not a pulmonary hypertension specialist. You should definitely be speaking to one if you're managing a chronic PAH patient. My primary reference regarding the classification and management of pulmonary hypertension is this document, which you can access online or download for free. It's the 2022 European Society of Cardiology and European Respiratory Joint Guidelines on Pulmonary Hypertension Diagnosis and Management. You can access them online through this link or by searching for European pulmonary hypertension guidelines. The goal of this video is to provide a conceptual understanding rather than specific management advice. If you want up-to-date clinical information on pulmonary hypertension, check out these guidelines or call an expert. Towards the end, I will also list some excellent journal articles on acute and critical care management that can serve as quick reference guidelines. So when do we use pulmonary vasodilators? The indications can be divided into hemodynamic and respiratory. Most of the drugs I'm going to discuss are used in chronic pulmonary hypertension, primarily group one or pulmonary arterial hypertension, which I'll go into the classification of. These patients stay alive because of these drugs. They need to be continued and often escalated when they come to hospital. Neonates with persistent pulmonary hypertension are a specific subtype and a major indication for inhaled nitric oxide but that's outside the scope of this talk. Other uses are far less evidence-based because no one's bothered to study it, but they include acute right heart failure due to PE, MI, sickle cell disease, and as well as some cardiac surgery and transplantation. Finally, some inhaled pulmonary vasodilators can be used for hypoxic respiratory failure, but that topic's a little bit more complicated than you might think. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a mysterious, rare, and lethal illness. Its history is intertwined with our understanding of vascular physiology, as well as a series of accidental mass poisonings. The first specific references to PAH are from 1891, when German physician Ernst von Romberg described autopsy findings as pulmonary vascular sclerosis. In 1901, Abel Ascherza in Argentina Link similar lesions to a syndrome of dyspnea, cyanosis, and polycythemia. It would be a few decades before significant further progress was made as it was difficult to understand causal relationships between the different findings, and this was confounded by a widespread erroneous theory that it was a manifestation of syphilis. In 1921, German physician Werner Forsmann performed the first right heart catheterization on himself proving that the procedure could be performed safely. Dickinson Richards and Andre Kennard 
further refined his technique and the three shared a Nobel Prize in 1956. The ability to invasively measure uh, hemodynamic parameters led to a flurry of breakthroughs in physiology. In 1947, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction was demonstrated for the first time in cats. In 1951, pulmonary vasodilation was demonstrated in response to the alpha adrenergic blocker tolazolene. The same year, David Dresdale coined the term primary pulmonary hypertension for a subpopulation of patients with elevated PA pressures on catheterization without an apparent cause. Some scientists questioned tol tolazolene's pulmonary vasodilator effects, claiming that they could be secondary to systemic vasodilation, and as a result, intravenous acetylcholine was chosen as it would be mostly inactivated due one during one transit through the lungs. In 1957, it was shown to act as a selective pulmonary vasodilator in patients with hypoxia or mitral valve disease. The following year, Australian physician Paul Wood published a groundbreaking paper describing his observations during right heart catheterization, proposing an early schema for the hemodynamic classification of pulmonary hypertension. He also used acetylcholine as a vasodilator and emphasized the importance of vasoreactivity in certain patients. In 1965, an ephedrine derivative known as Aminorex was released in Switzerland, Austria, and Germany as an appetite suppressant for weight loss. This triggered an epidemic of pulmonary hypertension with the incidence of this rare disease rising tenfold. This syndrome of drug-induced pulmonary arterial hypertension was found to affect approximately 0.2% of users with a peak latent period of about six months and most developing sy symptoms within a year. Some regressed after stopping the drug, but many progressed and approximately half of the patients had died by 1980. Survival appeared to be, depend on stopping before irreversible changes had developed. Aminorex was withdrawn after hundreds of cases and the anorectic industry knew, learned nothing from the tragedy, releasing fenfluramine in the early 70s. Although the outbreak did prompt new interest in pulmonary hypertension in the medical community, and in 1973, the World Health Organization met to discuss and attempt to standardize research into the disease. In 1980, American biochemist Robert Fushgott and colleagues were investigating vascular smooth muscle contraction after noticing that acetylcholine would only trigger relaxation if the endothelium was intact. They proposed that the endothelium received signals from the muscarinic receptors and then released another relaxation factor that inhibited smooth muscle contraction. The known endogenous vasodilator prostaglandin I2 or prostacyclin was eliminated as the effect persisted in the presence of cyclooxygenase inhibitors. Throughout the 80s, further experiments demonstrated that the factor was unstable and inhibited by hemoglobin, as well as compounds with redox activity such as methylene blue. In 1981, there was an epidemic of a scleroderma-like illness in Spain caused by the ingestion of adulterated rapeseed oil. The syndrome featured interstitial pneumonia, eosinophilia, and Raynaud's phenomenon, with a subgroup developing pulmonary hypertension. In the following decade, there were over 20,000 cases and 370 deaths. Following the recommendations of the WHO, the United States NIH created the first registry of patients with primary pulmonary hypertension in 1981. In 1987, Fushko and colleagues concluded that the endothelium-derived relaxation factor was the gaseous free radical nitric oxide. This was a landmark discovery and earned them a Nobel Prize in 1998. In 1989, Rubin and colleagues demonstrated that intravenous prostacyclin, known in its pharmaceutical form as epoprostanol, improved pulmonary vascular tone in patients with PPH. In the same year, there were around 1,400 cases in New Mexico resembling toxic oil syndrome. Patients had myalgia, eosinophilia, and scleroderma-like skin manifestations, with about 6% developing pulmonary hypertension. In 
The outbreak was subsequently linked to the consumption of impure L-tryptophan supplements. By the 90s, discoveries in physiology were being applied to practice. Inhaled nitric oxide was identified as a selective pulmonary vasodilator in animal studies in 1991. In 1995, over a century after the lesions were first described, epoprostenol was approved as the first specific therapy for pulmonary arterial hypertension. Prior to this, clinicians have been struggling with a combination of non-specific and supportive treatments, including calcium channel blockers, digoxin, warfarin, diuretics, and supplemental oxygen. Epoprostenol revolutionized PAH management, improving both functional status and life expectancy in PAH, but had to be given as a continuous intravenous infusion. Meanwhile, a second epidemic of anorexogen-induced pulmonary hypertension had been slowly developing since fenfluramine was released in the 1970s. Case reports as early as 1981 had suggested a similar cardiovascular risk to aminorex, and the risk of pulmonary hypertension was well established by the mid-1990s. Despite this, fenfluramine combined with fentermine, known as fenfen, and its D-isomer dexfenfluramine, known as Redux, were approved in the United States and aggressively marketed to millions of patients. The, the drugs were found to cause both pulmonary hypertension and a distinctive cardiac valvular disease, both thought to be mediated by serotonin. It's quite difficult to get estimates of the scale of this disaster. The reveal registry only mentioned 134 cases of toxin-induced PAH from around this era, but two estimates suggested 30,000 patients were significantly affected in the United States, which fits with an echocardiography study from Utah, which found hundreds with at least mild valvular disease, over 10% of those screened. Fortunately, like with Aminorax, many improved with cessation of the drug, although others progressed rapidly to death in under a year. Because people never learn, there was one more drug, Benfluorex, that was used in France until 2009 and killed an another estimated 2,000 people. For this massacre, the pharmaceutical executive got a four-year suspended sentence for manslaughter and a fine, which seems pretty light for killing 2,000 people, but maybe that's just me. After the FenFen scandal was peaking, the WHO held a second meeting in 1998 where they classified pulmonary hypertension into five categories based on etiology. This would be further refined in the fourth meeting in 2008. In 1999, inhaled nitric oxide was approved for medical use. Now, eventually the pharmaceutical company, companies got tired of just causing pulmonary hypertension and brought out the first oral agent, Bocentin, in 2001. Sildenafil was approved for the treatment of PAH in 2005. In 2013, Riosigwet, a new class of oral agent was approved, followed by another Selexipag in 2015. The point of this is that having actual specific treatments for pulmonary hypertension is very new. And this is tragic because the outcome of untreated pulmonary arterial hypertension is typically dismal. These are the survival curves for patients in that first NIH registry. For all patients, the median survival following diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension was 2.8 years. That's the same life expectancy as having untreated breast cancer. If you stratify by functional class, it's even worse. The WHO classes are essentially the same as New York Heart Association. So one is asymptomatic, two is mild symptoms with daily activity, three is severe symptoms with less than daily activity, and four is symptoms with any activity or at rest. So what's it like now that we have treatment? It's better, but not good enough. The median survival is about seven years. Epoprostenol alone increased five-year survival to 55%. That puts it a bit closer to laryngeal cancer with treatment, although not great. And you need to remember how invasive some of these treatments are. This is part of the reason we need to know about this disease because the survival rates have been hard fought 
and you wouldn't prescribe chemotherapy if you weren't an oncologist, but you might have to prescribe some of these drugs in the ICU. So how do these patients go in the ICU? One study looked at this and you might have noticed a theme here. The answer is not great. About a quarter died on their initial ICU admission. 17% were readmitted to the ICU and died. 12% died in the 12 months following discharge. Two lucky patients got a lung transplant after the initial admission to ICU, but overall not even half were alive at 12 months. The median time from these patients being diagnosed to their first ICU admission was two to five years depending on subtype. As expected, the odds for in-hospital mortality were markedly increased if they required dialysis, vasopressor or inotropic support, or mechanical ventilation. Other baseline factors included renal impairment, functional status, and hyponatremia. And as you can see, most of these were also predictive of their 12-month mortality, especially the functional status. So now we're going to look at some hemodynamics, specifically the concept of pulmonary vascular resistance, the long version of systemic vascular resistance. This is the defining physiological abnormality of pulmonary arterial hypertension, and it's what pulmonary vasodilators act on and reduce. To find resistance, we need to look at Ohm's law. A nice thing about physics is that rules can be used to some extent across different media like electricity versus fluid dynamics. Ohm's law is that V equals IR, voltage equals current times resistance. Electricians often depict this in a triangle for easy rearrangement, as you can see here. In the case of fluid dynamics, instead of voltage, it's pressure, or specifically the change in pressure. Instead of current, it's flow, but resistance is the same, so pretty intuitive. If you check out this schematic, you have a column of water or blood that's creating a pressure difference and a narrow pipe for it to flow through. Pressure is based on height, in this case, because of gravity. As you can see, the delta P is only the height above the level of the water where it's flowing, it doesn't include the height of the water at the end. This will become relevant later. Resistance is the narrowing that limits flow, but you could equal, equally argue that that is what causes the pressure, as without the resistance, all the flow, water would flow out immediately and the pressure would be dissipated. So what do these represent in the body? Flow is our cardiac output, which will remain constant between circulations. If we look at our pulmonary circulation first, the resistance is our PVR, and our final pressure is that of the left atrium, where that half of the circulation ends. The total pressure on the driving side is the mean pulmonary arterial pressure, the right side equivalent of what we normally call MAP. We're actually after the delta P, which is the mean pulmonary artery pressure minus the left atrial pressure. Left atrial pressure is hard to measure, but it's approximated by the pulmonary wedge pressure. You'd be familiar with this if you've ever used a Swan-Gans catheter in the ICU. On the systemic side, it's pretty intuitive. It's the mean systemic pressure or MAP, the systemic vascular resistance instead of the pulmonary, and delta P is the MAP minus the CVP. The driving columns on the, on the left are the aorta and on the right are the pulmonary arteries. The heart generates cardiac output, and the pressure is technically generated by the capacitance of those arterial vessels, which can be measured using the stroke volume and the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. That's too technical for this presentation, so we're not going to talk about capacitance, we're just going to focus on resistance. You could just as easily think of the heart as a pressure generator, particularly on the left side, because there's not supposed to be much pressure on the right, although that's the topic of this talk. So how do we calculate vascular resistance? We use Ohm's law. It's even rearranged at the bottom right of that big triangle. Resistance is delta P over flow. So for PVR, it's mean pulmonary arterial pressure minus left atrial pressure, all divided by cardiac output. You can do the equivalent on the systemic side as shown there. The cool thing is, depending on what values you start with, you can calculate any component, component by rearranging the equation. Mean pulmonary artery pressure is cardiac output times peripheral va uh, pulmonary vascular resistance plus left atrial pressure. 
cardiac output is mean pulmonary artery pressure minus left atrial pressure all over pulmonary vascular resistance. You can even calculate cardiac output on the systemic side and then use it to figure out PA pressure or PVR because cardiac output is conserved between both sides. So what else can we say about resistance? Because that was only looking at the broad scale. What makes up resistance? Well, if you have a driving pressure over a series of resistances, the total resistance is simply the sum of each component along the way. If it's in parallel, it's a little bit more complicated. The inverse of the total resistance is the sum of the inverse of each resistance, as you can see there. So to rearrange it, the total resistance is the inverse of the sum of all of the inverses, which means that if you have a, a lot of resistance vessels in parallel, the total resistance will fall, which is how our vascular beds work, and it's why the human body has relatively low vascular resistance overall. You can also combine the rules. For example, if R1 on the parallel example on the bottom is made up of three segments in series, then you could add the resistance of each together to get R1 and then use that in the parallel equation. So what about the individual segments? We'll have a segment up in the top right corner. We can work out the velocity of the fluid by dividing the flow by the cross-sectional area of the segment. Hopefully that should be pretty intuitive, but a useful way to check is if you look at the units in any equation you're rearranging, they should always make sense. So for example, we'll pick arbitrary units for this equation. Flow is volume over time, which could be cubic centimeter per second, which is mil per second. Area in this case is centimeter square because we need to use the same units for length. Because you're dividing, this will cancel out to centimeter per second, which gives us the units of velocity. You can use any units you want as long as you keep track of them and make sure that they're consistent. So where does resistance actually come from? Using the same vessel example for laminar flow, we can have the Poisset equation for hydraulic resistance. It's all, resistance is always equal to delta P over Q, but the units are just buried deep in this equation. The most obvious thing to come out of it is that resistance is inversely proportional to the radius to the fourth power, so that if a vessel decreases in radius or diameter, this will have a massive effect on resistance, which will be a major part of this presentation. The Greek letter eta on top in this case represents viscosity and is roughly equal to 0.035 pois for blood, depending on hematocrit and other factors. So pois is an old unit that's equal to dyne per second divided by centimeter squared because they didn't want to say that each time. What's a dyne then? Well, a dyne is just equal to 10 to the minus five newtons and it comes from an early precursor to the metric system, where they were using seconds, centimeters, and grams instead of seconds, kilograms, and meters, which is now the standard. I bring this up because you will have definitely seen dynes before when it's, because it's used when they report systemic vascular resistance in the ICU. So if length and radius are in centimeters, we know all of the units now and we can play around with the equation and figure out what units we should use to measure resistance. On top for viscosity, the units are pois or dyne per second, dyne times second on centimeter squared, times length, which is in centimeters, divided by radius, which is in centimeters to the fourth power. The eight and the pi don't have units here because they're constants. This will cancel down to dyne times second divided by centimeter to the fifth power, which is one of the two commonly used units for vascular resistance. And that's the one that's often reported on the hemodynamic output for systemic vascular resistance. Well, what's the other unit? Well, resistance is blood pressure over cardiac output, so can't we just use those units? It would be much easier. Well, yes, we can. And those units are naturally um, 
millimeters of mercury over liters per minute, which are known as wood units, after Paul Wood, who we mentioned earlier. These units are great because you can work with them with a pocket calculator at the bedside and it makes sense. One wood unit is about 80 of the other units, so that's how you convert one to the other. One last tricky thing about units is the vascular resistance index. You know that cardiac index is cardiac output divided by body surface area or leases per minute per meter squared. But for resistance index, the equation is delta P divided by cardiac index instead of cardiac output, otherwise they wouldn't work together, which means that vascular resistance index is actually vascular resistance units multiplied by body surface area and not divided, which will catch a lot of people up. So how does all of this resistance stuff apply to the body? Well, you have two ventricles and two circulations and they do two different jobs. The right heart is a low pressure system, or at least it should be, and it generates flow. It's only going through the lungs and back to the heart, so it's all right there in the thorax. It shouldn't be necessary for it to work hard. You can compare the top and bottom pressure volume loops. The right ventricle on the bottom has much lower contractility. The left ventricle is a high pressure system that needs to generate pressure for the body to use. Even though the pressures and the contractility are different, the stroke volume always needs to be effectively the same. Um, because the heart rate is equal and therefore the cardiac output is equal um, because it's all one loop of blood moving around so the flow should always be the same. Why is the systemic side high pressure? It needs to allow for various organ systems to draw as much bl blood as they need. Basically it's like the water pressure in your house and the resistance arteries arterioles are the taps. It's a high pressure, high resistance system that allows you to turn on a tap, reducing resistance at that point where you draw as much flow as you need. Some vascular beds like the brain or coronary arteries will always be drawing a certain amount, while others like skeletal muscle or even the skin under certain circumstances can massively increase blood flow, but don't use a lot at baseline. In a healthy person, what determines cardiac output is the venous return from all of the systemic tissues or down the train in our analogy. The body decides how much blood it needs and takes it and returns that used blood back to the heart and the, blood, the heart just needs to keep up. That's why the cardiac output goes up with exercise, although the body has a few tricks to stimulate the heart as well just to smooth everything out. Meanwhile, the right heart just pumps whatever it's given and the pulmonary circulation sends it through the lungs and back to the left heart. The main trick that the pulmonary circulation has is ventilation perfusion matching. If part of the lung is blocked or collapsed, you have a shunt for deoxygenated blood, which is seriously detrimental for oxygenation because the bulk of oxygen is in hemoglobin and it, there is a maximum to how much oxygen the other vessels can take up. As soon as the deoxygenated blood mixes with the pulmonary venous blood, it will drop the average oxygen content significantly and this can't be fixed by breathing more or even administering supplemental oxygen if it's bad enough. To correct the physiological shunt, the pulmonary blood vessels constrict down and divert the blood through the better oxygenated parts of the lung. This is the opposite of what happens in systemic vessels during hypoxia. So what happens if we add a huge amount of resistance on the pulmonary artery side, for example, a big pulmonary embolus? If you look at the lower pressure volume curve for the RV, this imposes a huge afterload, shifting the effective elastance line, which is roughly a product of the pulmonary vascular resistance and the heart rate and this will reduce the stroke volume significantly because it has to intersect with the already quite low contractility for the right ventricle. The smaller stroke volume causes an underfilled left ventricle because over time 
the stroke volume and therefore the cardiac output need to equal out between two sides. And as you can see on the steep LV curve, this will abruptly drop the systemic blood pressure to around 70 millimeters of mercury, which would explain the hemodynamic instability that you see in a large pulmonary embolism. Let's look at these relationships in a bit more detail. This is going to be the right ventricular death spiral. We have the left and right ventricular pressure volume loops, which are bounded by each ventricle's end systolic and end diastolic pressure volume relationship. Our inciting incident is a state of right ventricular failure, which means either the contractility is too poor or the afterload is too high but acutely it's not able to deal with the load that's imposed on it. You can see the right ventricular pressure volume loop drifting to the right and the left ventricular pressure volume loop drifting to the left and already the stroke volume and cardiac output with and systemic blood pressure will be starting to fall. The increased load, depending on the exact circumstances, will impose different anatomical changes on the right ventricle, such as dilation or hypertrophy. Functionally, this will increase right ventricular wall tension and impair perfusion of the right ventricle, which causes a de some degree of ischemia, which further impairs right ventricular contractility. You can probably see that a vicious cycle is starting to form because if the contractility wasn't impaired before, it is now. Meanwhile, as the volume of the right ventricle increases, the bulging right ventricle has been pressing on the left, which is further impairing LV filling because they're together in a tight space. With decreased preload, the otherwise functional left ventricle is failing to maintain cardiac output which decreases systemic blood pressure and further impairs the coronary perfusion to the right ventricle. What you're seeing are the systemic and pulmonary pressures starting to approach each other, which should not happen. These mechanisms are confounded further by neurohormonal responses, tricuspid regurgitation and in some cases, excessive iatrogenic fluid therapy in an attempt to treat the plummeting systemic blood pressure. The spiral ends with irreversible cardiogenic shock and the death of the patient. This is how many pulmonary hypertension patients eventually die, as well as people with severe right ventricular MI and massive pulmonary embolism. Let's go back to our circulation loop, except we'll unwrap it and look at some actual normal values. Now you can really see the difference between the high pressure systemic circulation and the low pressure pulmonary circulation. The cardiac output is the same throughout. Normal cardiac output for adults sits between four to eight liters per minute. Normal cardiac index is between 2.5 to four liters per minute per meter squared. The reason cardiac output is a broader range than index is because it's not corrected for on an individual basis for body size, which makes index a somewhat more useful measure in practice. What are the normal pressures on the pulmonary side? One to remember will be your mean pulmonary artery pressure. The upper limit is 20 millimeters of mercury. The mean left atrial or wedge pressure is between two and 12, and the difference between these, which is our driving pressure, delta P, is between about seven and 14. Delta P is sometimes called the transpulmonary gradient. It's the same thing. For now, just remember that a normal PA pressure is 20 or less. Meanwhile, on the systemic side, we have a much larger driving pressure, though the left the right atrial pressure or CVP is roughly the same as the left atrial pressure. Now, if we have the cardiac output and various pressures, we've covered how to get vascular resistance. The normal pulmonary vascular resistance, which is the key value of this video, is between 0 
and 1.6 wood units or 20 to 130 using the other units which is that multiplied by 80. The pulmonary vascular resistance index just uses cardiac index instead and is pulmonary vascular resistance times body surface area which gives a normal range of 3.2 to 3.6 wood units per uh, times sorry meter squared or 255 to 285 using the other units. It's a tighter range because it's indexed, like we discussed, although for whatever reason, the pulmonary hypertension specialists tend to use the non-indexed PVR um, and typically wood units, which are at least easier to remember. The normal systemic vascular resistance is between eight and 10 times higher than the pulmonary vascular resistance. And that's about all you need to know about that. I've just put up the numbers for the sake of completeness. Don't try to remember all the different values. You can refer back once they're all up on the screen. Um, you should just can compare the systemic and pulmonary in general. And let's look specifically at the pulmonary circulation now. I'm going to outline the hemodynamic classification of pulmonary hypertension as well as what defines pulmonary hypertension. Because we're now talking about pressure, let's rearrange that equation to mean pulmonary artery pressure equals pulmonary vascular resistance times cardiac output plus left atrial pressure, which is our baseline. It should be pretty clear there that you actually have three variables contributing to the pressure pulmonary vascular resistance, cardiac output, and left atrial pressure. And these values will define the hemodynamic classification based on which abnormality is causing the high pressure. Remember our normal range for pulmonary artery pressure, this is the mean we're talking about, is between nine and 20 or 10 and 20 if you wanna round it out. Until recently, pulmonary hypertension of any type was defined as mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 25. But more recently, the um, cutoff has been lowered um, just because the condition is so deadly, uh, they're hoping to catch cases earlier so they can initiate monitoring and management. The gold standard means of diagnosing pulmonary hypertension is right heart catheterization, which is what gives us all of these values. Above 20, the pressures are divided somewhat arbitrarily into mild, moderate, severe, and systemic, where patients in the systemic range, based on the interaction of the LV and the RV, um, is very serious and could essentially die at any time. Don't remember these specific cutoffs, by the way, because uh, they will vary between sources and the pressure itself doesn't always correlate with the severity of the disease for reasons that we'll go into. This is how um, pulmonary hypertension is classified based on hemodynamics and we've got some normal values here for the um, mean pressure, the vascular resistance, cardiac output, left atrial pressure from the previous slide. We also have the delta P which is also known as the transpulmonary gradient and the diastolic pulmonary gradient, which just uses the diastolic instead of the mean uh, for DPG. Some people use those. The values are, are, of the pressure gradients are relatively useless overall because they're dependent on both the pulmonary vascular resistance and the cardiac output and don't tell you which one's abnormal. I've included them because they're required by some of the definitions. First type, we have precapillary pulmonary hypertension. This is your classic form of pulmonary hypertension because it's high pulmonary artery pressure due entirely to raised pulmonary vascular resistance and not a component of left atrial pressure. It's called precapillary because the typical pulmonary arterial hypertension has most of the resistance coming from the level of the arteries and the arterioles such that the pressure at the capillaries, the alveoli, and the veins is normal. However, there are rare exceptions, which are pulmonary veno-occlusive disease and pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, 
which are rare, horrible conditions, which are difficult to manage and I'll not focus on. But in those cases, the PVR is high and it's not pre-capillary technically, um, but it would still fit into that category. There's an interesting variant of pre-capillary uh, pulmonary hypertension, which is exercise pulmonary hypertension, where someone might have a normal PA pressure at rest, but an abnormal PA pressure with exercise. And from the equation, we should be able to see that the PA pressure should actually go up with cardiac output, but in these people, it goes up disproportionately. You can spot it by measuring a set of hemodynamics at rest and with exercise, and then dividing the change in the mean pressure by the change in the cardiac output, which literally gives the PVR. In case you're curious, you do the exercise test by doing a right heart catheterization with them supine, and then they have a modified exercise bike, which just uses the legs. Um, the abnormality here is not the blood pressure, it's the vascular resistance, and it was just masked by a relatively low cardiac output. This relationship becomes relevant later in classic pulmonary arterial hypertension, because as the PVR continues to progress over time and increase, the cardiac output falls with right heart failure, and therefore the resulting pulmonary pressure doesn't indicate the true severity of the disease. There's also a subtype outside of normal classification with a high resting cardiac output and a normal vascular resistance. This is uncommon, it might be seen in cirrhosis or hypothyroidism, or probably the most extreme form would be wet beriberi due to thiamine deficiency, which you might remember causes right heart failure. Now we go to the other extreme, which is post capillary, defined by a left atrial pressure greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. As you can imagine, this occurs in left heart failure or mitral valve disease. There's two subtypes. There's the isolated form with a normal vascular resistance and a mixed form with an increased pulmonary vascular resistance and transpulmonary gradient on top of the left atrial pressure. And this might be due to secondary arterial hypertrophy in response to the high pressure from the left heart. That's the, and there's our mix there. Um, that's the hemodynamic classification. There's also the more etiological classification that we mentioned in the WHO conferences. Um, and that's the form that most people are more familiar with. Uh, group one of this classification is um, our classic pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is the idiopathic or drug-induced um, form um, and is by definition pre-capillary. Group two is pulmonary hypertension secondary to left heart disease, which is by definition post-capillary, although it can be either mixed or isolated. Group three and four are secondary to uh, pulmonary disease or venous thromboembolic disease. Um, both of them are pre-capillary, but for different pathophysiological reasons. Group five are miscellaneous and poorly or poorly understood, um, often multifactorial and can fit any of the hemodynamic categories. Hopefully you can see from this how useful a right heart catheterization is both in diagnosing the condition and also classifying the hemodynamics, and you can even get a possible etiology by assessing the hemodynamics. For example, if the um, left atrial pressure is high, then it's probably due to heart, a left heart disease. Every presentation on pulmonary hypertension needs to have a section devoted to this classification. I'll try and make it a bit more interesting by including the approximate proportion of each of um, cases that each represent, as well as the estimated prevalence within a group with a certain risk factor of pulmonary hypertension because that's what really matters at the bedside. How likely is this patient to have pulmonary hypertension? This was designed with Australia in mind, but it's probably generalizable to other parts of the Imperial Corps like North America and Europe.
pulmonary hypertension is a neglected disease and part of the reason for this is that it was traditionally thought of as rare. It's not though. We see patients with pulmonary hypertension all the time except most of the time it's due to heart failure or COPD or sleep apnea. A cohort study from Ontario gives us perhaps the best estimate of population pre level prevalence for all subtypes in a comparable population of 0.1% of adults and 0.06% of children with an overall incidence of 24 per 100,000 per year. I suspect these are underestimates because they are based on diagnosed primary or secondary pulmonary hypertension and we don't always pick it up. The Armadale Echo cohort estimated a prevalence of at least 0.3% for all types. In different populations, rates can potentially vary wildly based on the prevalence of risk factors such as cardiac, respiratory and liver disease or connective tissue diseases such as scleroderma, hematological diseases like sickle cell, infectious diseases like HIV, schistosomiasis and rheumatic fever. The prevalence of group 1 pulmonary hypertension is approximately 80 to 100 cases per million population based on registry and PBS prescription data, although this is only a small slice of the total. Group 1 includes idiopathic pH, which was PAH, which was normal, formerly known as primary pulmonary hypertension and is probably the largest su single subcomponent in Australia. The next subtype is heritable pulmonary hypertension, also known as familial, um, and it appears in clusters typically autosomal dominant within families with incomplete penetrance. Of the different genes identified, by far the highest risk is bone morphogenic protein receptor protein 2, and we'll discuss that one later. The other genes are mostly associated with the same pathway, although the third one on the list is a type of eukaryotic translation initiation factor and causes a different subtype, which is the pulmonary veno-occlusive disease or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, which are related um, and is sort of outside of uh, this general group in group one. It's estimated that 20% of patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension also have a sporadic mutation in BMPR2, further suggesting that the diseases have a common pathogenesis involving that pathway. Now we've already discussed some of the drug-induced cases, such as with the anorectic or toxic oil syndrome. Another more recent association is with, is with tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are used for cancer. These patients may also have a genetic predisposition and the drug idiopathic inheritable groups are included together in many studies. The next category is PAH associated with other conditions such as connective tissue disease. Um, the highest risk is in scleroderma or systemic sclerosis where about 12% may um, develop pulmonary arterial hypertension and has led to active screening in this population. 0.5% of people with HIV can develop PAH. It's also associated with portal venous hypertension in liver disease and it's seen in approximately 3 to 9% of liver transplant candidates. Globally, schistosomiasis is one of the major causes of pulmonary arterial hypertension and it occurs in 5-10% to 10 of patients with the chronic hepatosplenic subtype. It also occurs in patients with chronic hemolysis, possibly due to nitric oxide dysfunction, and has an estimated prevalence of 6% in people with sickle cell disease. The final point on this section is persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, um, which is failure to transition from fetal circulation. This is somewhat sometimes designated as one with two primes, and it's a slightly different pathology. 
speaking of which, one prime is the venal occlusive and capillary diseases. They can be particularly nasty, even for pulmonary hypertension, um, which is it's sometimes hereditary and it's difficult to treat because pulmonary vasodilators in these cases can risk causing pulmonary edema, which really limits your options and it might ne necessitate early referral for transplant. Fortunately, it's quite rare. What isn't rare is group two pulmonary hypertension, which is secondary to left heart, chronic left heart disease, which is by far the largest cause of pulmonary hypertension in the Australian population. Um, as you can see there, it's approaching sort of 75%. Um, it's subcategorized as due to LV systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, and valvular disease. In diastolic dysfunction, it's um, it's very it's it's so sometimes it can be misdiagnosed as group one due to a relatively normal echocardiogram, which emphasizes the importance of right heart catheterization for diagnosis. Um, in particular, among the valvular disease, uh, we're talking about mitral and um, aortic valvular disease. I've included some rates for a population which primarily had rheumatic mitral stenosis, and it, the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension obviously depends on severity. The main treatment in these cases is to address the underlying cause, but the prevalence, um, the presence, sorry, of pulmonary hypertension is certainly an additional risk factor for mortality in these patients. The next largest group is pulmonary hypertension due to chronic lung disease or chronic hypoxia. In this case, the inciting pathology is um, likely hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction followed by vascular remodeling, although there may also be genetic components. It's present, in, pulmonary hypertension is present in 20% of patients with uh, admitted to hospital with a COPD exacerbation and respiratory failure. In end-stage COPD, it can be about 50%. It's probably even more common in interstitial lung disease with about 30 to 40% of patients, such as, um, it's also one of the most serious complications of obstructive sleep apnea with um, a prevalence of about 15 to 20% in this group. Interestingly, it occurs in approximately 6% of people living over 3,000 meters. Um, this is known as high altitude pulmonary hypertension. And it's thought that those affected might have a genetic predisposition and that some people living in, for example, Central Asia, who traditionally live at high altitudes, um, may have increased mutations that are protective against pulmonary hypertension for um, fairly obvious evolutionary reasons. Next, we have group four, known as chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, or CTEPH. This is relatively uncommon, but it's an important subtype because it necessitates specific management and can otherwise mimic group one. It's also one of the few subtypes that's potentially curable. It's estimated that 0.5 to 4% of patients um, will go on to develop pulmonary hypertension following a um, pulmonary embolism. Unfortunately, 30% of patients diagnosed with this subtype will not have a known history of venous thromboembolism, which also highlights um, why they might need a, something like a VQ scan if they're getting a right heart cath to diagnose. Um, those ones probably had a cult pulmonary emboli and were never noticed. All of these patients require lifelong anticoagulation and depending on the location of the stenosis, it might be treatable with a pulmonary endarterectomy, which is in itself a very high risk surgery and requires circulatory arrest. If the disease is a bit more distal, it can be managed with balloon angioplasty, but some patients are considered inoperable um, and are managed medically with pulmonary vasodilators and anticoagulation, obviously.
Group five are the miscellaneous group, um, which I've seen described as the orphan's orphan disease. It includes diseases where the mechanism is multifactorial or poorly understood. For example, four to eight percent of people with myeloproliferative diseases, like essential thrombocytosis, have pulmonary hypertension. It's higher if they're on tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Splenectomy in itself is a modest risk factor. Um, a large number of patients with sarcoidosis have pulmonary hypertension, with around 78% in one group awaiting lung transplant. Other causes include certain inborn areas of metabolism, thyroid disorders, and malignancies directly um, impinging on the pulmonary circulation. A very important subtype is renal failure. Um, chronic kidney disease, especially on dialysis, and especially if they have an AV fistula where it's seen about 40% of patients. The reason I've included all of this epidemiology is because while idiopathic pulmonary hypertension might be relatively rare, you're much more likely to see it comorbid with something like thromboembolic disease or dialysis. We've also seen, we also see a lot of these patients who have one risk factor, worsening shortness of breath and just haven't had an echo recently or haven't had a right heart cath, so they may have been um, undiagnosed. And I just noticed on that last slide that I forgot to mention congenital heart disease, which is a very important cause and is uh, one of the major groups in group one. The prevalence in adults has been said to be about 5 to 10 percent, but obviously it depends on the subtype of uh, congenital heart disease um, because that's going to, the anatomy is going to very uh, distinctly affect the pathophysiology. Um, now, before we talk about uh, drugs, we need to talk about how smooth vascular smooth muscle actually contracts, as this is essential to understanding the different treatment pathways and how they are linked to pathogenesis. This is the molecular site of smooth muscle contraction. On top, we have a thin filament, a double helix of actin. Below it, we have part of a thick filament which contains myosin. This is half of a myosin II structure with a heavy chain forming a globular head and a long tail. And on the neck, uh, essential and regulatory light chain. Myosin in this case is an ATPase, which hydrolyzes and releases an ATP molecule in a multi-step process, using it to bind to actin, change shape, and then detach, providing one small mechanical stroke in the process. In this frame, the ATP has already been hydrolyzed, but is still bound to the head as ADP and phosphate. Smooth muscle is functionally closer to many non-muscle cells than it is to skeletal and cardiac muscle, which use an entirely different contractile mechanism involving calcium directly and troponin. In fact, you see a very similar process to smooth muscle contraction as part of platelet activation, which uses the same signaling molecules. Contraction depends on the action of myosin light chain kinase, which phosphorylates the regulatory light chain at serine 9, 19. This leads to a conformational change that allows binding of the head to the actin filament. There's an optional extra phosphorylation at 3 and 18 that sustains contraction, but serine 19 is necessary and sufficient. After it binds to actin, the head releases its phosphate molecule and it undergoes a rotational conformational change known as the power stroke. After this, the head releases AD ADP, which is exchanged for a new ATP molecule. The ATP binding allows dissociation from the actin filament. At this point, the ATP is hydrolyzed to a new ADP and phosphate, and the head returns to its original position for another cycle. Now let's see all of that together. This will continue as long as there is available ATP and until the phosphate on the regulatory light chain is removed by a different enzyme, myosin light chain phosphatase, which terminates the contraction process. As I briefly mentioned, each myosin unit is actually two heavy chains woven together, although I was just showing one for simplicity.
Many myosin units combine to form a thick filament. Unlike striated muscle, which has bipolar rows of myosin pulling actin in the same direction in an organized sarcomere, smooth muscle features side polar rows pulling in opposite directions, forming a contractile bridge that can shorten actin fibers unimpeded down their entire length. These myofilaments anchor together to dense bodies in a relatively disorganized fashion throughout the smooth muscle cell. Once activated, the network of fibers shorten and contract the entire cell in a mostly longitudinal direction. When organized circumferentially, for example, around a blood, pressure, blood vessel lumen, this causes constriction. We've seen how phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of the regulatory light chain regulate smooth muscle contraction, but what controls those processes? An essential component is calcium. Basically, intracellular calcium binds to a regulatory protein called calmodulin, which binds and activates myosin light chain kinase. The active myosin light chain kinase phosphorylates the regulatory light chain, causing contraction like we just saw. There's also another kinase called calcium calmodulin dependent kinase, which will inhibit this process as at high calcium concentrations for a bit of negative feedback. When the cell is fully at rest, the cytosolic concentration of calcium is about 0.1 micromoles per litre, and when the concentration increases tenfold to one, it will maximally activate the myosin light chain kinase, increasing its activity a thousandfold. One micromole per litre is still a thousand times less than extracellular concentration. So where does the calcium come from? Like in skeletal and cardiac muscle, it depends on voltage-gated calcium channels and cell depolarization. Though in smooth muscle, most cytosolic concentration comes from outside the cell, rather than from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. I've included some of the transporters that will maintain the ion gradients in the bottom right, although the dynamic changes in membrane potential are triggered by channels in the top, top right. The other major difference with striated muscle is that it's less of an all or nothing phenomenon in smooth muscle. Smooth muscle cells can partially depolarize with an intermediate calcium influx and vascular tone. In fact, most smooth mu muscle cells are in a state of partial activation and can even have slow oscillations in membrane potential over time. I've included a few of the mechanisms by which calcium is recycled and these processes are regulated. This is gonna become quite a busy diagram, for, so for clarity, I've made everything that enhances vasoconstriction and proliferation, proliferation this sort of purple lavender color. And everything that stimulates relaxation is the teal green color. The few neutral components will be uh, gray blue. So we've got myosin light chain kinase on one side and that's mainly regulated by calcium. On the other side, we have myosin light chain phosphatase, which is trying to strip the phosphate off and relax the myofilament. This is where we get a lot of second messaging pathways converging. Myosin light chain phosphatase is regulated by a couple of protein. The main one is MYPT1, which is bound to it and will stimulate or inhibit the enzyme based on where it's phosphorylated. Being phosphorylated at one site will inhibit the other site, which turns it into a sort of switch. There's also the pro-vasoconstriction CPI-17, which inhibits myosin light chain phosphatase when it's phosphorylated. Now for second messengers. If you've done any pharmacology at all, you'll know about G-protein coupled receptors. There's three main trimeric um, subtypes, which will activate or inhibit the CAMP pathway or activate the DAG IP3 calcium pathway in this case of the Q11 subtype. IP3 triggers calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is going to help activate myosin light chain kinase, and you can tell from the color coding that it's a pro-vasoconstriction pathway. Calcium and DAG will also activate CPI17 via protein kinase C, which is a further mechanism of vasoconstriction. While we're looking at vasoconstriction pathways, there's actually a fourth G protein coupled receptor subtype, which is the 1213 subtype, although that's not linked to a normal trimeric G protein. Instead, it features a small monomeric GTPase known as Rho.
When Bro is activated, it binds to Bro associated kinase or ROC and stimulates both of these regulases towards vasoconstriction. So what receptors stimulate vasoconstriction via these two pathways? Well, there's several, with many inflammatory mediators acting via Q11 coupled receptors, although most potent vasoconstrictors will act by both the 1213 and the Q11. These include the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, certain inflammatory prostaglandins, thrombin, angiotensin-2, and a peptide signaling molecule called endothelin-1, which is a very potent vasoconstrictor uh, secreted by endothelial cells. You might also notice 5-HT or serotonin here. This is thought to be how appetite suppressants like amino X and fen-phen caused pulmonary hypertension. There's one receptor missing, and that's the V1 vasopressin receptor. The reason I haven't shown it here is that we're talking about the pulmonary circulation, and V1 receptors aren't present on pulmonary vascular smooth muscle, only in the systemic side. In fact, vasopressin is probably an indirect pulmonary vasodilator, which I'll explore shortly. Next, we have cyclic AMP protein kinase A pathway, which is activated by the vasodilating S subtype G protein coupled receptors via adenylate cyclase, which is also inhibited by the IO receptor subtype, which acts as a mi relatively minor contributor to vasoconstriction. Our final but probably most important vasodilatory pathway involves cyclic GMP and protein kinase G. This does not involve G protein coupled receptors at all. It's activated by two different forms of guanylate cyclase, the natriuretic peptide catalytic catalytic receptors and the enzyme soluble guanylate cyclase, which is stimulated by nitric oxide. Apart from the receptors, the CAMP and CGMP pathways are very similar. Both nucleotides are degraded by phosphodiesterase, but with different specificities based on the subtype of the enzyme. Both stimulate myosin light chain phosphatase and inhibit Rho A calcium influx and cell depolarization. You can see some mechanisms here. There's one more thing to mention here. You might remember in the history section that the scientists found that acetylcholine stimulated vaso pulmonary vasodilation, but only in the presence of an endothelium release factor. We know that factor is nitric oxide, but where does it come from? As it turns out, the Q11 G protein coupled receptors have the opposite effect when they're on an endothelial cell. This is how vasopressin, acetylcholine, and bradykinin are pulmonary vasodilators in this context. It activates the same pathway as in smooth muscle, except the calmodulin goes on to activate endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which stimulates nitric oxide synth synthesis from arginine. The nitric oxide diffuses to the smooth muscle and activates the cyclic GMP pathway. Meanwhile, the calcium, to a lesser extent, will stimulate phospholipase A2 and activate the synthesis pathway for prostaglandin I2, known as prostacycline, or by its drug name, epoprostanol. This is the second major endogenous vasodilator and works via the adjacent cyclic AMP pathway. Finally, endothelial cells secrete the vasoconstrictor endothelin-1, though the process is a bit more complicated. It involves gene transcription, which is stimulated by various different physiological factors and inhibited by the protein kinase A, protein kinase G pathways. Once transcribed and translated, the protein undergoes further modification and is secreted. It acts on smooth muscle cells primarily via the endothelin A receptor. And um, it also acts indirectly to a lesser extent via the endothelial endothelin B receptors, where it actually acts as a vasodilator as a part of negative feedback. This essentially brings us um, to the site of all of our drug um, drugs that we use as pulmonary vasodilators. On the left, we have um, the prostaglandins, which include uh, prostaglandin I2 is the most clinically relevant. 
Also via this pathway, we have beta agonists like dobutamine and isoprenaline. Adenosine is an impractical vasodilator, but it's sometimes used for pulmonary vasoreactivity testing. Then we have the nitrodilators, including nitric oxide itself. There's also a novel agent called Rhea Sigwart, which activates soluble guanylate cyclase directly without nitric oxide. Then we have the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, uh, which are milrinone, um, which acts non-specifically on a cyclic GMP and AMP by inhibiting phosphodiesterase 3, and the oral PDE5 inhibitors, sildenafil and tadalafil. Milrinone is actually orally bioavailable as well, but it turned out to be horribly toxic when they tested it on outpatients with chronic heart failure, so it's been relegated to the acute setting. Calcium channel blockers are non-specific vasodilators that are used in a subset of pulmonary hypertension patients. Then we have a class that's only used in pulmonary hypertension, which are the endothelin receptor antagonists, bosentan, masotentan, and ambrosentan, of which only ambrosentan is specific for endothelin A receptors. Brief mention of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. This isn't still fully understood, but it's thought to involve alteration in reactive oxygen species and or redox signaling from the mitochondria in response to hypoxia, which leads to activation of the rho kinase and calcium pathways and vasoconstriction. I mention it here because oxygen is our most ubiquitous pulmonary vasodilator. There's one more thing that's important to mention about these drugs. The pathways that stimulate pulmonary vasoconstriction, even hypoxia, will also stimulate pulmonary vascular smooth muscle proliferation. And conversely, pathways that inhibit pulmonary vasoconstriction can also inhibit proliferation. This is an important insight for the management and understanding of pulmonary arterial hypertension, but it's not quite the whole story. Last bit of cell signaling, I promise. I mentioned that the genetics of pulmonary arterial hypertension all seem to revolve around bone morphogenic protein receptor 2. BMPR2 is a catalytic receptor for different types of bone morphogenic protein related to the G TGF beta receptor. It requires a co-receptor known as ALK1, also known as ACVRL1, with which it forms a dimer. On endothelial cells, the main ligands are BMP9 and 10. They bind to the dimer and BMPR2 activates ALK1 through phosphorylation. ALK1 goes on to activate SMAD1, 5 and 8, which enter the nucleus and with the aid of non-specific nuclear binding protein SMAD4, promote transcription of some key genes. Along with some non-canonical signaling pathways, these lead to the inhibition of apoptosis, proliferation and inflammation, stimulation of nitric oxide, oxidative metabolism, and for the cells to remain quiet and differentiated and just do their jobs. There's also an opposing pathway stimulated by TGF-beta that inhibits all of this. In smooth muscle, you have the same pathways, although the effectors are slightly different. BMPR weakly promotes apoptosis, inhibits proliferation, migration, inflammation, and endothelial secretion. The proposed common pathway for the pathogenesis of pulmonary arterial hypertension is the development of a functional BMPR2 deficiency. This is why having a single mutation is such a risk factor, with over 20% of carriers going on to develop PAH. One study of a cohort of idiopathic, hereditary, and drug-induced PAH patients found BMPR2 mutations in 29%. Patients with the mutation, on average, manifest the disease 10 years younger and have 35% higher pulmonary vascular resistance. It's thought that there often needs to be some form of second hit. This could be a somatic mutation that knocks out the remaining gene, like we see with certain cancer suppression genes. There could also be intracellular downregulation via inhibitors or degradation of either the protein or messenger RNA. There could also be a hit somewhere else in the pathway, or the pathway could just be overwhelmed by external stimuli such as angiotensin II or endothelin.
whatever the reason, the patient develops a functional BMPR2 deficiency, which leads to dysfunction of the pulmonary vascular endothelium, smooth muscle, as well as other cells like fibroblasts. In the endothelium, we have an increase in both proliferation and apoptosis, which also causes the release of more TGF beta. It causes an increase of inflammation, decreased nitric oxide release, transition to anaerobic metabolism, and even a transformation from endothelial cells to mesenchymal cells known as M endomt. Meanwhile, the smooth muscle decrease in the smooth muscle has decreased apoptosis, increased proliferation, migration, and inflammation, and it will start to release endothelium 1. Now let's look at the broader process. You have an initiating event, which can be through genetic or epigenetic factors, vascular stimuli, including drugs, hormones, shear stress, or hypoxia, and this common pathway of functional BMPR2 deficiency, as well as an endothelium that's not working properly. You have smooth muscle contraction due to an alteration of vasoactive and inflammatory mediators, and you also have platelet interactions. Next, you have smooth muscle proliferation, remodeling, inflammation, and thrombosis, fibroblast proliferation, and intimal thickening. And then finally, you have progression to irreversible remodeling, generation of plexiform lesions, obliteration of blood vessels, and the physiological impact of all of this is a pro progressive rise of pulmonary vascular resistance. And that's exactly what we see, a progressive rise in pulmonary vascular resistance. This is the typical progression for a hypothetical patient with pulmonary arterial hypertension. The PVRI values are a little bit higher than before because they're indexed and therefore multiplied by body surface area. At the bottom, you have the progression of the functional status um, from asymptomatic to death. You can actually see the pulmonary artery pressure rise and then fall because as the disease progresses, you'll start to see a drop in cardiac index, which is the other determinant of pulmonary artery pressure. While pulmonary artery pressure and PVR can be somewhat useful for diagnosis and stratification, the most useful prognostic features are functional status and signs of cardiac dysfunction. One of the most ominous hemodynamic signs that you'll see late in the disease is a rise in right atrial pressure which is an indicator of right heart failure. I've color-coded some of the values based on where they match to the risk stratification in the European guidelines. The WHO functional status is one measure, but the other more continuous variable is how far a patient can walk in six minutes. You'll see this in many guidelines and studies. The hemodynamic changes can be relatively subtle initially, but once patients become symptomatic, the life expectancy without treatment is very short. The condition should be recognized as a potential death sentence and evaluated by experts as soon as possible. You can see how the values correlate with the risk stratification model used in the initial assessment of a patient following diagnosis in the European guidelines. The low risk group have a one year risk of death of less than 5%, while the high risk group, it's greater than 20%. You can also see how large an emphasis is placed on functional status and features of right heart failure, because they're trying to spot where they fit on that progression and treat accordingly. The management of pulmonary hypertension is centered around continuous risk stratification and this is the more comprehensive tool that they use in the process. There's also a simplified four strata model, which only uses three values, the functional class, the six minute walk distance, and a blood test for B natriuretic peptide as a marker of right heart strain. This four strata model divides the intermediate category into intermediate high and intermediate low, and also has strong prognostic ability although I'll read a qualifier from the guidelines.
At follow-up, the four strata model is recommended as a basic risk stratification tool, but additional variables should be considered as needed, especially right heart imaging and hemodynamics. At any stage, individual factors such as age, sex, disease type, comorbidities, and kidney function should all also be considered. What does the clinical course and management process look like to the patient? After the initial symptoms, they'll usually be evaluated in primary care, and the usual symptoms are going to be shortness of breath and exertion. They'll probably undergo screening investigations that might not find a problem or might be suggestive of pulmonary hypertension in the case of the echocardiogram. A VQ scan is also recommended at some point, typically, to exclude chronic thromboembolic disease. The European guidelines have a nice algorithm for once you're suspecting the patient might have pulmonary hypertension, so I'll include that here. The key message is to make sure the process happens quickly because as soon as they're diagnosed, they can be started on specific treatment and monitoring. I cannot emphasize enough how deadly this condition is. In the next step, they'll hopefully be referred to a pulmonary hypertension center and undergo right heart catheterization. This is the gold standard investigation and it's recommended for diagnosis, although it can be a stumbling block because it's invasive and there is some associated risk or even costs if you live somewhere with a, without a function, proper functioning health system. They recommend it if, that if you do do it, you need to do it properly, include all of the hemodynamic variables and vasoreactivity testing to allow proper risk stratification. Once they're diagnosed, they can add a couple more tests like six minute walk and BNP to see how they fit in the three strata model that we just saw. After this, they get started on treatment with higher risk patients on more aggressive treatment. After that, you assess their response and continue to follow them up and modify the treatment over time. How do you assess the response? With a repeat risk assessment which can be a, an abbreviated um, model like the four strata one. The key message, the key principle to managing this illness is you want to keep ramping up treatment until you push them into a low risk group and keep them there. Because generally there's not gonna be a cure unless the patient ends up with a transplant. Now, before we talk about specific treatments, we should think about what would be the ideal pulmonary vasodilator. They love questions like this in the primary exam, by the way. We'd want something that's chemically stable, that's easy to administer, and ideally doesn't need to be infused parenterally. Now, the pharmacokinetics are tricky because in the acute setting, we want something reversible and titratable, but we almost want the opposite for chronic management. It should be relatively specific for the pulmonary vasculature and we, as we don't want to cause systemic hypotension. It should ideally preserve or augment hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction as most systemic vasodilators will worsen VQ matching. Lack of uh, rebound effects or other significant adverse effects doesn't interact with other drugs, either pharmacokinetically or pharmacodynamically or need dose adjustment in different populations such as liver or kidney disease. Wide therapeutic index. Epoprostenol is deadly both in overdose and underdose, which is not ideal. Of course, it should have effects on the disease process as well and improve mortality because that's why we're using it. Let's talk about BQ matching. This is the degree of effective ventilation divided by the blood flow that an alveolus or lung region receives. And it can range from zero to infinite, but it's typically somewhere in between. It can be part of a physiological variation that normally occurs in the lung due to gravity and other factors. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is designed to minimize VQ mismatch, particularly shunting, which is when the ratio approaches zero. In pathological states, it will become more extreme and will impact the efficiency with which the lungs exchange gases, most importantly oxygen with the blood. A pulmonary embolism involves mechanical occlusion of pulmonary vessels, 
causing physiological dead space, though it can also reduce perfusion through secondary vasoconstriction as clots release mediators such as thrombin, ADP, and thromboxane A2. This vasoconstriction might be an important factor in the deadly hemodynamic effects of PE. Shunt is the most harmful VQ mismatch for oxygenation. If we want a vasodilator that preferentially works on the pulmonary circulation, we have another a, a number of options. We could find drugs that act via receptors or pathways that are only or preferentially found in the pulmonary circulation. Another option, if we were giving an intravenous drug, would be something that was broken down extremely rapidly, like adenosine or acetylcholine or um, some of the prostaglandins that can such that less of it will make it across the lungs to the systemic side. A problem giving drugs systemically is that they will likely also dilate vessels affected by hypoxic vasoconstriction, which means that any shunt will get worse. This might not be a problem if you're treating the patient for their hemodynamics and they have reasonable lung function, but it tends to be more of a problem in the acute setting. Another way to bypass the problems of non-selectivity and VQ mismatch might be to give the drug by inhalation. This delivers the drug directly to the pulmonary circulation and specifically only to those alveoli that are accessible from the airways, which means that it shouldn't worsen shunt, in fact, it should make it better. This is the rationale for giving short-acting inhaled pulmonary vasodilators in hypoxic respiratory failure. There is still some nuance here though, because some drug will likely still enter the systemic circulation and even worse, might circulate back to the pulmonary circulation, but this time it would be acting non-selectively. If the drug's very long acting, then most of its effect could be through this lingering systemic absorption and not via the lungs, which could even worsen oxygenation. There are other reasons to give something via inhalation. For example, it might be the most convenient route for a drug with poor oral bioavailability, like some of the prostaglandin analogues. On the topic of inhaled vasodilators, let's look at the prototypical inhaled vasodilator, which is nitric oxide, and how it relates to the other agents that work by the cyclic GMP pathway. As an unstable gaseous free radical, the only way to administer nitric oxide itself is via inhalation, where it does act as a selective pulmonary vasodilator due to where it's been administered. We do have other drugs that work by releasing nitric oxide, these are called nitrodilators and include sodium nitroprusside and glycerol trinitrate or GTN. These are typically given intravenously, at least systemically in the case of GTN, but both can and have been given via inhalation where they become much more specific for the pulmonary circulation. SNP is very rapidly transformed in red blood cells to nitric oxide and five cyanide ions as well as converting hemoglobin to methemoglobin in the process. It's an extremely potent vasodilator and non-specific between venous and arterial. It's worth noting, noting that inhaled nitric oxide also causes methemoglobinemia at high levels. GTN on the other hand is less direct, needing to be transformed with the help of mitochondrial aldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme in adjacent tissues. This likely influences both its preference for venodilation and its development of rapid tolerance due to alterations in the transforming enzyme. Other drugs working further down the pathway involve, include Rio Siguat, the relatively new guanylate cyclase stimulator, and the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, such as sildenafil, tadalafil, which inhibit cyclic GMP-specific PDE5, and milrinone, which inhibits the nonspecific PDE3, which also gives it its inotropic properties. Incidentally, milrinone can be given intravenously or by, via inhalation. Three of these drugs are commonly used in the treatment of chronic pulmonary hypertension, sildenafil, tadalafil, and reosiguat. Sildenafil was first licensed and one of the first oral therapies after bocentan. 
It's shorter acting with a half-life of about four hours and does have an intravenous form, which could give it advantages in the acute setting if the patient was unable to absorb tablets or hemodynamically unstable. Tadalafil has a much longer half-life, about 16 hours, which allows for daily dosing and makes it more convenient for patients and the bioavailability is a bit more reliable. This, is, this means that it's now the preferred first-line agent in its class. Reaseguat is relatively new and second-line therapy for pulmonary hypertension, although as far as I know, it's in the United States, it's the only drug officially licensed for the specific treatment of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. The side effects for these drugs are to be expected from vasodilators and include flushing, headaches, epistaxis, arthralgia, nasocongestion. Arthralgia, I think, is unrelated. The major drug interaction is a pharmacodynamic one. The two classes are contraindicated both with each other as well as um, with all other nit nitrodilators, as, such as GTN, as the combination can cause life-threatening systemic hypotension. All of them require dose adjustment in severe renal impairment and are not recommended in severe hepatic impairment, as this is the primary mode of elimination. Reaseguat metabolism is also induced by smoking. Reaseguat is contraindicated in pregnancy, although pregnancy is not typically indicated in pulmonary hypertension due to the high maternal risk. Next, we have the other main oral agents, the endothelin receptor antagonists, or ERAs. As mentioned, only ambrosentan is selective for the endothelin receptor A, but this doesn't seem to impact efficacy, as macetentan and ambrosentan are both considered first line. Both of these drugs have an effective half-life of about 15 hours and can be given once daily. They have similar side effects to the GMP agents, but can also cause hepatic dysfunction in, about, in certain patients. Um, typically about 10% of patients with Bocentan will see a rise in the transaminase um, liver function tests on blood tests, um, which will tend to regress with dose reduction or discontinuation, um, but does necessitate um, monthly blood tests. Other disadvantages, um, they can be relatively obscure um, to source. They have some CYP interactions, particularly with um, inducing the metabolism of cyclosporin via 3A4. Um, and they're contraindicated in pregnancy, like we said with rear sigwat. Um, that is already going to be a very high risk situation. So patients are already encouraged to be on contraception. Now we have to look at the prostaglandins. This is gonna be a relatively complex topic because there are multiple types of prostaglandin and multiple receptors with overlapping affinities. And let's start with the receptors. Prostaglandin receptors are G protein coupled receptors. And as proteins, they have a common evolutionary origin and have diverged over time. This tree illustrates the relative similarity between the different types as well as with some non-prostaglandin receptors. You might notice that the DP2 receptor is very much separate from the others. Each receptor has a primary G subunit which determines its cellular effects. EP3 is special because it has a number of splice variants which are sometimes associated with different G proteins. Although for our purposes, um, we can consider it being associated with the IO subtype. Prostaglandins are made from fatty acids, with the prostaglandin 2 family being made in a common pathway from arachidonic acid. You can see the molecular structure here, although it might be easier if I show it with a, a kink in, in the middle, because that's a distinctive part of the child molecules. The common pathway involves the synthesis of pros prostaglandin G2 with cyclooxygenase and then prostaglandin H2 with peroxidase. And then finally, the different molecules based on their respect respective tissues having specific synthases. 
I'm also going to include prostaglandin E1, which is made via a different pathway from one of the arachidonic acid precursors. Each receptor was named based on their primary agonist, which is the major affinity shown here. As a result, some receptors, um, especially the EP receptors, have very different effects, but a common name and a common agonist. And because this is medicine, we have a bunch of messy overlapping secondary affinities. But we can see a general trend here. On the left, we have more relaxing, vasodilatory and anti-inflammatory compounds such as prostacyclin and prostaglandin E1. While on the right, we have more um, constricting pro-inflammatory compounds such as prostaglandin F2-alpha and thromboxane A2. Many of these compounds are used in their unaltered form as drugs, which is why they have additional names. There are also many analogues. For example, misoprostol is an analogue of prostaglandin E1, although in the process it became primarily an EP3 agonist. Alprostadil itself, the drug form of prostaglandin E1, is used in neonatology um, to keep the ductus arteriosus open, as well as for erectile dysfunction. Finally, epoprostanol, the drug form of prostaglandin I2, was the first specific pulmonary hypertension drug and remains a major part of therapy, along with some newer analogues. The analogues are each agonist for the IP receptor, but they can have some other affinities. These include iloprost, baroprost, Treprostanil, and then finally we have Selexapag, which is not a prostacyclin analogue, but it is an unrelated IP receptor agonist. Epoprostanol, prostacyclin analogues, and other IP receptor agonists have numerous properties that could be beneficial in pulmonary hypertension, including vasodilation, platelet inhibition, and anti inflammation. Epoprostanol markedly changed the life expectancy of patients with pulmonary hypertension, and it remains the treatment of choice for the highest risk patients. Unfortunately, with a half-life of three minutes, it's far from perfect, needing to be given as a constant intravenous infusion. This comes as a major imposition on patients' lives, in, along with serious risks of line-associated complications and abrupt disc decompensation if the infusion is stopped for any reason. I don't know about you, but I would find an intravenous infusion that I need to have at all times to stay alive pretty existentially disturbing. As a result, they've tried to come up with analogues with different properties. For example, Iloprost is about 10 times longer acting, which means it can be taken as an inhalation, but it does need to be taken about every two hours while awake, and it takes a bit of time to do properly. Then there's Triprostanil which has a half-life of three hours, so that's 60 times longer than epoprostanol. That's considered as effective when given intravenously, but it does take a bit more, and it does have a bit more time before the devastating withdrawal effects if it gets, gets disconnected. Triprostanil can also be given as a subcutaneous continuous infusion, and which eliminates the problems of long-term central venous access although some people find the subcutaneous infection too painful. It also had advantages over Iloprost, as the inhaled form only needs to be done four times a day. Baroprost is a prostacyclone analogue with decent oral bioavailability, though it's mostly used in Eastern Asia for reasons I don't quite understand. Triprostanil can be given orally as well, but the absorption is probably a bit unpredictable. That brings us to the pretty exciting newcomer, Selexapag, which is a selective IP agonist with different properties to the prostanoids, giving it decent oral bioavailability and the longest half-life of any of the drugs in this family of about four and a half hours, meaning that it can be comfortably, comfortably dosed BD. In terms of adverse effects, there are quite a few and are related to the class plus the mode of administration.
They have pretty significant vasodilating side effects, including postural hypotension and even syncope. There's also flushing, headache, diarrhea, as well as jaw pain, particularly with the first bite of a meal, which is apparently unique to prostacyclins. They can also cause thrombocytopenia. In fact, epoprostanol is such a potent platelet inhibitor that it can be used as an anticoagulant in extracorporeal circuits, so there is a decent theoretical bleeding risk. Inhaled therapy can cause side effects such as cough and hemoptysis. Subcutaneous therapy can cause pain, as mentioned, and local reactions. IV therapy has significant complications related to venous access, as well as the pump and dosing. Epoprostanol has significantly lower rate of line infections, probably because the drug is very basic with a pH of about 11, while triprostanil is neutral. I'm now going to try and summarise the European guidelines for the therapy of pulmonary arterial hypertension, and by that I'm referring to Group 1 on the WHO classification. They start with some general instructions for the management of all patients, which includes supervised exercise within symptom limits, psychosocial support, obviously very important, as well as monitoring adherence to therapy, which is vital, immunisation against pneumococcal disease, flu, COVID-19, long-term oxygen if the PaO2 is less than 60, especially for when flying, correct iron deficiency if causing anemia, diuretic therapy if features of right heart failure, aiming for euvolemia. I haven't mentioned pregnancy too much so far, but pregnancy is extremely high risk in pulmonary hypertension due to the associated hemodynamic changes. Previous maternal mortality rates have reached 56% and are still about 11 to 25%. The guidelines specifically recommend that patients do not become pregnant and should explore other options, acknowledging that this is a sensitive topic and suggesting that shared decision be making be used in low risk subpopulations. Patients at risk of becoming pregnant should have a reliable form of contraception such as an interuterine device. Surgery is another important topic with similar risks. For a cohort of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension undergoing non-obstetric, non-cardiac surgery, the perioperative mortality was 2% for elective procedures and 15% for emergency procedures. They advise in the guidelines that the decision to perform surgery should be made by a multidisciplinary team involving a pulmonary hypertension physician and must be based on individual risk benefit assessment, stating that general recommendations cannot be made. They also advise that nonspecific heart failure therapies, including ACE inhibitors, ARBs, neprilysin inhibitor, beta blockers, SGLT2 inhibitors, and evabridine not be commenced unless required for comorbidities. Finally, they state that there is a lack of evidence of specific benefit for anticoagulation in these patients, so no general recommendation can be made. Obviously, we're not talking about group four pulmonary hypertension. To start right at diagnosis, patients with idiopathic drug or heritable pulmonary arterial hypertension should undergo vasoreactivity testing. This is to identify a subgroup of PAH patients who might respond well to calcium channel blockers alone. They recommend it be performed with inhaled nitric oxide or iloprost. Previously, adenosine has been used, um, but it causes more adverse effects. IV proprostanol can also be used. A positive response is a reduction in mean pulmonary arterial pressure of at least 10, 10 millimeters of mercury to an absolute value less than 4, 40, with no reduction in cardiac output. Unfortunately, 10, less than 10% are positive responders. If they are positive, the advice is to start a vascular selective calcium channel blocker and then titrate to a relatively high dose as shown here. Probably the optimal agents are going to be amlodipine or felodipine, as they have long half-lives and are relatively well tolerated. After three to six months, patients should have a complete reassessment, including a repeat right heart catheterization. To be considered a success, they need to have a normal or near normal resting hemodynamics, functional class one or two, and a low BNP.
If that's the case, they can keep management the same but need to be assessed every six to 12 months. If the response is inadequate, the algorithm moves to the more specific pulmonary arterial hypertension therapy, although you may consider continuing the calcium channel blockers if there was a partial response. Negative responders or those with connective tissue disease related pulmonary arterial hypertension also start at this point. They start with the con comprehensive three star so risk assessment. If they're low or intermediate risk, they recommend oral combination therapy with an ERA plus a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. In practice, that's Tadalafil and either Ambrosentan or Masatentan. This is pretty good for the patient because it means oral once daily dosing and a monthly blood test. If they're high risk, they go straight to maximal medical therapy, with, which is the same oral combination therapy plus an either IV or subcutaneous prostacyclin analogue, which means epoprostanol or troprostanil as a continuous infusion. Remember that these patients have a one year mortality risk of over 20%, so you need to get that risk down quickly. What happens if they have severe respiratory or cardiovascular comorbidities such, as con such that combination therapy is contraindicated? They recommend starting either an oral ERA or an oral PDE5 inhibitor as monotherapy, and after that, individualizing management. The algorithm can only take you so far. This is one area where you need an expert. They do mention that if the patient is, has particular high risk features, see if you can get away with some form of combination therapy. Once treatment is started, you assess their response and re-stratify based on the four strata model. If, they're tr if they remain truly low risk, then you can continue current therapy as is and continue to monitor. Patients need to be continuously follow up, ideally every three to six months. Remember, patients can potentially get a lot worse in a year's time. If they're intermediate to low risk and they're on an oral combination therapy, they recommend adding oral selexapag for a far less invasive form of triple therapy. They also state that changing the phosphodiesterase inhibitor to reaciguat is another option, but with a lower level of recommendation. If they're intermediate or high risk, add a, prostas add a parenteral prostacyclin and then refer for lung transplant evaluation. If starting a parenteral agent is not feasible, they suggest using the low intermediate escalation strategy. All of these recommendations are based on clinical trials and specifically those with the most morbidity or mortality oriented endpoints. Other treatment options such as adding inhaled triprostanil or iloprost have less of an evidence base and it could be considered to improve exercise capacity. So what about lung transplant? How do these, how do these patients do? Um, if we look at 10 year survival for idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, it's still not amazing, although if you compare it to the four strata high risk patients, they already have better outcomes. We can probably assume that these would have been the highest of the high risk patients as well. What about compared to other lung transplant recipients? Here are the curves for COPD, cystic fibrosis, and ILD. As you can see, it's generally comparable, but in particular, pulmonary arterial hypertension patients have the worst three month and one year mortality, uh, due to a higher rate of primary graft dysfunction. This is their prognosis on the condition that they survive the first year post transplant. As you can see, they follow a similar trajectory to the cystic fibrosis patients, which is on the better end. This is relevant because it's possible that particular high volume centers might have lower rates of that early mortality. We also have to consider the quality of life impact. With transplant, the right heart function typically improves rapidly and many can stop basodilator therapy 
What does chronic management look like in practice? This is based on registry data from Australia in 2018. As you can see, almost 40% of patients were on monotherapy with an endothelin receptor antagonist, which even at the time was not standard of care. The report was highly critical of the fact that the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, which is supposed to allow patients to access medications in a relatively affordable manner, would not allow combination therapy in many cases and often prevent patients from being eligible for treatment unless they were already in functional class three or worse. They've taken some measures to address this since, but I still think it's gross that they go to such lengths to withhold treatment from what is overall a very small group of patients. About 36% of patients were on oral combination therapy. I think a fair number would get the phosphodiesterase inhibitor as a non-Medicare script to, uh, to optimize the costs. Around 10% were on triple therapy with a prostacyclin analog, mostly epoprostanol, although some of them were on inhaled iloprost. There are a total of nine patients on Riasigwat and Selexapag was not available in Australia at the time. I'm going to talk about managing pulmonary hypertension in the acute setting. This could be the chronic PAH patient who is decompensating or an acute patient with a pulmonary embolism. I'll start with PAH and then I'll talk about how these principles might vary for other pathologies. Now, I don't expect you to necessarily trust a random person on the internet. So I've included six great articles here that you can refer to in practice. You should be able to find them online. Some of them have particular emphasis, for example, emergency department versus intensive care, or specifically how to manage medications. So what should you do if a patient with pulmonary arterial hypertension shows up in a crisis? Rule one, get expert help. Contact the patient specialist or the local PAH referral center this is an extremely specialized area with drugs that you're likely to be unfamiliar with. These patients are also among the most hemodynamically fragile that you're likely to encounter. I would expect them to present looking peri-arrest. If they're stable, that's a bonus and you should consider transferring them early. If things go badly, they might need mechanical circulatory support. You need to think about what your center is able to offer. Rule two. Never interrupt prostacyclin therapy. That's keeping them alive. Try to keep them as close as they can to their current therapy. Epoprostanol has a half-life of about three minutes. If it washes out of their system, their vascular tone can rebound and they can fatally decompensate. If it's working, don't touch it. If you need to do something with it, ask for expert advice. And when I say expert, you can also ask the patient or their family in some circumstances because they probably know more about it than you do. These pumps are designed to be portable and run over 24 hours. So it's going to be a very concentrated solution. The dead space in a catheter lumen can cause a delay of many, many half-lives, either for epiprostanol or triprostanol. So if it's being changed over, if it's being changed over and also, there's a risk of accidentally bolusing epoprostanol, which can cause lethal hypotension. Again, if it's working and you don't know how, how to deal with it, don't touch it and ask for help. Make sure the nursing staff managing the patient are also aware of the risks. They should be left to run on their own dedicated line. You probably want to get a pharmacist early, uh, involved early as well. At our referral centre, these infusions are exclusively managed by the advanced lung disease team with their specialist physicians and nurses. Treatment principles. Remember that oxygen is a pulmonary vasodilator. Hypoxia and hypercarbia will increase their pulmonary vascular resistance. Positive pressure ventilation is good for reducing LV afterload, but increases RV afterload. So you want to, in want to avoid intubation and NIV if you can help it. You want these patients to be normovolemic with adequate preload, but not so much that it compresses the left ventricle. For PAH, this probably means diuresing them aggressively and maybe even ultrafiltration if required. If they are shocked and objectively hypovolemic, you could consider giving some fluid, uh, 
but be careful because it's more likely to be a cardiogenic picture. You want to avoid tachycardia, in particular tachyarrhythmias. If they are in rapid AF, um, then cardioversion might be the safest option, especially versus drugs with anti-inotropic properties like beta blockers. For cardiogenic shock, the major treatment will be an IV inodilator, such as dobutamine. Side effects will likely be a modest reduction in systemic blood pressure and possible tachycardia tachyarrhythmias at higher rates. On the topic of afterload reduction, continue the patient's own vasodilator therapy, especially prostacyclone based. If they're hypotensive and on oral agents like tadalafil, I'd probably liaise with their specialist about whether or not they would suggest giving it. You may also want to consider inhaled vasodilators like nitric oxide in select patients who are unstable or needing further afterload reduction or to augment management of hypoxia. I'll discuss those separately. You do still need a certain amount of systemic vascular tone to aid with perfusion, which includes the right ventricle. You want to use agents that are relatively pulmonary sparing. Noradrenaline is still in most recommendations and is probably safe if used carefully. Vasopressin is pulmonary sparing, although less titratable, so if they have high vasopressor requirements, you can safely add it to offload some of the detrimental effects of noradrenaline. Phenylephrine is considered worse in terms of SVR-PVR ratio. Identify and treat underlying cause of their decompensation, such as MI, sepsis, or pulmonary embolism. And again, get expert help. Consider transfer and escalation of therapy to mechanical support, such as VA ECMO, if required. I'm going to talk about inhaled therapy specifically because there's a lot of options. Nitric oxide is probably the best well known, but milrinone and the indirect nitrodilators are other possibilities. There's also the prostaglandins, which include epoprostanol and other prostacyclin analogs, as well as prostaglandin E1, interestingly. We should also briefly discuss delivery devices. Nitric oxide has its own system, but in a hospital, most other therapies are gonna be delivered by nebulizer, and there's a couple of options. This is a jet nebulizer. You're probably most familiar with these. They're cheap and can just plug into an oxygen bottle or wall air um, and deliver an aerosol in about five to 15 minutes, depending on the volume. They can also be connected to a ventilator circuit using a T-piece if required. Now this is a mesh nebulizer. They're a bit fancier and use an electrically driven vibrating mesh. I've included an Aerogem one because that's what I'm used to using. They're generally considered more efficient at delivering the drug to the patient despite a lower fluid um, aerosolization rate. This one consists of a chamber with an attached T-piece, as well as a controller with a USB power source, so you can just plug it into the back of the ventilator. They're designed so that you can plug the T-piece into the ventilator circuit at the patient end or down at your humidifier so that it can be used with the same setup with NIV or high flow nasal cannula therapy as well. The other neat thing is that you can attach a syringe driver full of the medication and run it continuously. You just need to check, check that the controller is on the right setting and that it doesn't time out. They also use specialized connectors um, so that, for example, if you're using eproprostanol, um, uh, healthcare staff don't get confused and accidentally give it intravenously. This is where uh, you need to really think about dosing rate because it will deliver what you pump in at up to about 12 mils an hour although generally it's designed to run at about eight mils an hour, um, which means that if you're gonna individualize the dose of say, epoprostanol, um, you actually need to work out the concentration that's gonna run at eight mils an hour. Finally, we have computer controlled adaptive aerosol delivery systems, which are designed to deliver drugs like Isloprost in the community. Basically, the patient needs to cooperate with specific technique and it only delivers drug during inhalation. This is an INEB with an Isloprost cartridge and this is the Tyveso nebulizer for triprostanol. I thought I'd include this as well, which is a new 
um, dry powder inhaler for troprostanil, which is tiny, and it means that you can condense therapy down to one breath four times a day, which I think would really appeal to some patients. Why do we use inhaled vasodilators? There's a couple of advantages. It delivers the drug directly to the site of action, which means drugs like prostaglandins with poor oral bioavailability can be given less invasively. It means that some drugs that are otherwise non-specific vasodilators act on the pulmonary circulation because of where they are delivered, minimize systemic side effects. Finally, it means that in theory, the drug works preferentially on ventilated lung, reducing shunt and potentially even improving oxygenation. As I said before, nitric oxide is the prototypical inhaled vasodilator. As a relatively unstable gas, it can only be given by inhalation. This gives it certain advantages. For example, it can be delivered in a uniform fashion, blended into oxygen therapy, unlike most nebulized therapies, which are less efficient. Due to this, it's dosed in parts per million of inhaled gas. There is a great deal more physiology to nitric oxide that I haven't covered and honestly don't fully understand. In short, it's more complicated than a G protein coupled agonist like prostacyclin because it affects the redox state of cells. It is cytotoxic at high concentrations, but might be cytoprotective at lower concentrations. The usual starting dose is mo for most indications is 20 parts per million, and a lot of the toxicity is seen at 80 parts per million or greater. The takeaway point from this whole slide is that if you want an inhaled vasodilator to improve oxygenation, it needs to be short acting. If it persists for more than a few circuits through the circulation, then at some point, there's gonna be more drug in the systemic venous blood than there is in the alveoli, which will make oxygenation and VQ matching worse. A moderately long acting drug might still be a fine pulmonary vasodilator for hemodynamic effects, and giving it by inhalation may still be preferable to giving it intravenously in certain circumstances, a truly long-acting drug is probably better to be administered by injection. Nitric oxide has a half-life of less than 10 seconds, and it works fantastically as a pulmonary vasodilator, both for hemodynamics and for oxygenation. I'll designate this with a symbol of a heart and lungs to compare it to other drugs. While it certainly does improve oxygenation, it has not been proven to improve mortality and respiratory failure and in some studies, at least in adults, and in some studies has been associated with harm, such as renal dysfunction, likely due to some of those additional um, redox um, related effects. So what does this mean for using it in respiratory failure? It's probably that we need to stick to the basic things that do work before resorting to nitric oxide. For example, high PEEP, lung protective strategies, prone ventilation, and neuromuscular blockade. The guidelines that do mention inhaled vasodilators for acute adult respiratory failure will either state that there's insufficient evidence to recommend them, or that they could be used in a select group of patients in, with severe hypoxia that's unresponsive to those other proven therapies, either prior to or as a bridge to extracorporeal therapy. And when they say this, they're usually talking about nitric oxide specifically. One of the more common, commonly referenced toxicities is met hemoglobinemia, where iron in heme is oxidized from 2 plus to 3 plus. This is dose related, but can be monitored with cooximetry on a blood gas. The other is formation of nitrogen dioxide with oxygen, which can cause lung irritation and damage usually at high nitric oxide and oxygen concentrations. Nitric oxide often comes at a higher concentration, for example, 8,000 or 1,800 or 1,000 parts per million dissolved in nitrogen for stability, which means that if you're giving 80 parts per million, you can only achieve a maximum of 90% FiO2 due to the additional nitrogen of the 800 parts per million solution. Although, if you were going to give it at the recommended 20 parts per million, it would be closer to a maximum of 98% FiO2, which is less significant. 
Finally, because of the short half-life, nitric oxide has a significant rebound effect similar to IV epiprostanol and needs to be very slowly weaned. Most institutions will have protocols for this. It also necessitates a backup supply and delivery system in case one fails. Occupational exposure is not typically a major issue as levels quickly drop to background with distance, but it could theoretically pose a problem in a confined space such as a vehicle. The other major barrier with nitric oxide therapy has been capitalism. When it was discovered to be beneficial in neonatology in the 90s, a hospital in the UK put together a nitric oxide delivery and monitoring system for the, pr for the cost of 25 vials of epoprostenol, after which they could safely administer the gas for $2 an hour, which was eight times less than administering prostacycline. The gas was provided by their usual medical gas supplier, Bock. Meanwhile, in America, Ino Therapeutics, lately bought, later bought by iCarrier, put a patent on this endogenous vasodilator, which is literally a nitrogen and an oxygen atom bonded together and prohibited other suppliers from providing it in most, most of the developed world after 1999. They put together a similar delivery and monitoring system to what they'd already used in that neonatal unit and slapped a meter on it so that you could charge for the number of hours that were used instead of using gas quantity. Because you see, babies only have small lungs and they don't actually need much gas, especially if you're giving 20 parts per million or less. This increased the cost of nitric oxide therapy per hour to between by between 20 and 60 fold, which made it six to 10 times more expensive than epiprostenol, which was already expensive. If you remember this guy, that's the kind of increase we're talking about. Anyway, they say it's part of their whole package, but if you see how they talk about their customers in the Security and Exchange Commission filings, it just creeps me out a bit. Anyway, I thought I'd get that out of the way before I spruik their device a bit. The top bit is the main device that controls everything. This lower part is actually a much more, much more low-tech blender um, that functions as a backup or transport delivery system. The system interfaces with a ventilator circuit pretty easily. It has an injector where the gas is added and a gas sampler closer to the patient to confirm the concentration and monitor nitrogen dioxide levels. You can even run it with low flow oxygen. Um, via nasal specs. Anyway, around 2013, their patent ran out and they lost their monopoly, which means that we now have generic versions in brighter colors that are suitable for pediatric use. There's also a tankless version, which uses nitric oxide cartridges, which are pretty cool. Um, there's even designs for um, systems that produce nitric oxide as needed, either from a chemical precursor, which is nitrogen tetroxide, or even electronically using atmospheric nitrogen and oxygen. So maybe that will drop the price a little bit. But what if we don't have a nitric oxide system available? We also have the indirect nitric oxide donors. Um, this sodium nitroprusside, which is one of our shortest acting vasodilators, um, it's very potent and it's selective um, for the pulmonary circulation when inhaled at lower doses, although at high doses it does have some systemic vasodilation associated. Inhalation certainly does improve VQ matching and oxygenation. The main downsides are a lack of evidence base for inhaled therapy, lack of experience with the drug and availability outside some ICUs, as well as potential toxicity and adverse effects. But we also have GTN, which is only slightly longer acting and probably just as effective. It also has less toxicity and is likely the most readily available option in an emergency department, for example. It is likely to improve VQ matching and oxygenation, as well as lower pulmonary vascular resistance. A suggested bolus dose is 5 milligrams of the IV solution over 15 minutes, then repeated as needed. The effects could be expected to last up to 30 minutes. Then we have epoprostenol. We know that the intravenous form is still the gold standard therapy for pulmonary hypertension treatment. 
As a continuous nebulization, it's the best studied alternative to nitric oxide. It has similar hemodynamic effects, although it's slightly less specific, uh, selective for the pulmonary circulation than inhaled nitric oxide. And it is considered non-inferior in hypoxic respiratory failure, although the evidence for nitric oxide to start with wasn't fantastic. The effect lasts a little longer than nitric oxide. Both can theoretically cause platelet dysfunction, but a randomized study of cardiac surgery patients found bleeding rates to be similar. In terms of disadvantages, the Flowland formulation can stick to a ventilator circuit and cause mechanical problems. There have also been concerns that the high pH around 11 of the intravenous formulation could possibly contribute to lung injury. Epoprostanol is now cheaper than inhaled nitric oxide for reasons that I have discussed. While the intravenous route is likely preferable for most hemodynamic indications due to reliable admission and titration, if patients also had significant hypoxia and particularly shunting, or the clinicians were otherwise trying to maximize pulmonary selectivity, this might be a reason to consider the nebulized route. I did see one case report where an antepartum patient with pulmonary hypertension was changed from intravenous to inhalational epoprostanol just prior to labor and delivery to avoid a higher bleeding risk with systemic epoprostanol. What about the other prostacyclin analogs? Well, Ilaprost has the advantage of actually having a formulation that's designed to be nebulized. It has an effective half-life of about 20 to 30 minutes, which does start to become significant in terms of selectivity. It is a potent pulmonary vasodilator, but the half-life means that there's more spillover into the systemic circulation, and it can cause marked hypotension in the critically ill. And by that, I mean systemic hypotension. Some studies have found a benefit for oxygenation with an effect lasting for around an hour, although others found it merely neutral in terms of oxygenation. Now, trepressed Triprostanil is long acting. I can't picture a reason to start someone on inhaled therapy with this in the critical care setting. The duration of action means that it will mostly be systemically active and probably worsen VQ matching and oxygenation irrespective of the route of administration, although it does have advantages for outpatient therapy. Now, Inhaled milrinone is well past the point of being useful for oxygenation, but it's potentially a very nice drug for hemodynamic management, as it is also a positive inotrope. It lasts significantly longer than GTN or Ilaprost as well. Compared to IV milrinone, it's less likely to have significant VQ mismatch and systemic hypotension. I did, see, I did also see mention of inhaled levosimendin, which is um, technically an indirect vasodilator, but Honestly, that all seems a bit silly because the active metabolite has a half-life of about 80 hours. So you really might as well just give it intravenously. Um, the one, there is one other prostaglandin as well, which I haven't discussed, which is prostaglandin E1, known as alprostadil as its drug form. It's a bronchodilator, it's a vasodilator and an inotrope used in neonatal critical care to maintain the ductus arteriosus in critical heart lesions. It's significantly shorter acting even than epoprostanol with 70% cleared during one passage through the lungs. Unfortunately, it's much less studied than epoprostanol or nitric oxide. There was a recent retrospective study from Texas where they had been trialing it for adults um, for both hemodynamic and respiratory indications, although inexplicably, they'd been using it intermittently despite the ultra rapid duration of action. They reported 67 unique dosing regimens ranging from two hourly to 24 hourly, which really makes me question the underlying rationale. Finally, I had to include oxygen as the original inhaled pulmonary vasodilator. There are occasions when the hemodynamic effects of oxygen become significant most notably with single ventricle congenital heart lesions where oxygen needs to be carefully titrated in order to keep the systemic and pulmonary circulations balanced. Massive pulmonary embolism is one of the most dramatic examples of acute right heart failure that we commonly see.
Of course, the priority is to treat the clot, usually with systemic thrombolysis, although some centres have the option of catheter-directed therapy and surgical thrombectomy. They also require systemic anticoagulation. Other than that, the management is very similar to the principles outlined for pulmonary hypertensive crisis. I'm extremely curious about the possible benefits of inhaled uh, pulmonary vasodilators in this group, patient group. There's been one or two studies involving nitric oxide, although so far they haven't produced enough evidence to recommend them directly. Um, VA ECMO is a likely rescue therapy, although should be combined uh, based on the guidelines with surgical embolectomy. In right ventricular myocardial infarction, you can also see significant hemodynamic compromise. Like any MI, the priority is going to be reperfusion, ideally by PCI. In the event of a coronary occlusion, the right ventricle tends to tolerate ischemia better than the left for a number of reasons, including lower oxygen demand, greater reserve for oxygen extraction, perfusion across the cardiac cycle, and supply from both coronary arter arteries. This means that reperfusion may save viable myocardium even if performed relatively late. These patients tend to need reasonable preload and may require a little more volume resuscitation than a typical PE or pulmonary hypertension patient. Avoid diuretics and be very careful with GCN as it can cause abrupt systemic um, hypotension. Um, and also watch for the development of other sequelae such as bradycardia or atrioventricular block. Um, it's also helpful to convert atrial fibrillation back to sinus rhythm if possible, um, as it might improve their hemodynamics. The last subgroup I'll mention here is acute chest syndrome in sickle cell disease. We do not see much sickle cell disease here at all. It's likely less common than pulmonary arterial hypertension. This complication is significant though, as it's responsible for 70% of ICU admissions and most deaths from sickle cell disease. The pathophysiology is complex. It usually follows a vaso-occlusive crisis and features a vicious cycle of lung injury, hypoxia, and hemolysis. Pulmonary vascular dysfunction is a universal feature and acute pulmonary hypertension is common and a poor prognostic sign. There's an interesting possible rationale for using inhaled nitric oxide in this patient group, as people with sickle cell disease typically have depleted endogenous nitric oxide due to circulating free hemoglobin from hemolysis. One randomized placebo-controlled trial assessed inhaled nitric oxide at 80 parts per million, looking at a composite endpoint for treatment failure. They did not find a significant difference, though the baseline severity was relatively mild with a median FIO2 requirement of 30%, only one intubation in each group and no deaths. A post hoc analysis did find an apparent benefit in the subgroup of patients with severe, um, significant hypoxemia. To summarize, the body has two circulatory systems um, in series, but one of them is generally ignored because it's harder to measure. Remember Ohm's law, and the different elements that determine pulmonary arterial pressure. These basically give you the different hemodynamic subtypes of pulmonary hypertension. In vascular smooth muscle, vasoconstriction is stimulated by the calcium Q11 and Rho pathways, as well as indirectly by depolarization, G protein, inhibitory G protein receptors, and phosphodiesterase. The pathways for vasoconstriction also lead to proliferation and vasodilation is stimulated by the CAMP and CGMP pathways, as well as cell hyperpolarization. The endothelium is an essential part of vascular physiology. It produces one primary vasoconstrictor, endothelin, a primary vasodilator, which is nitric oxide, and a secondary vasodilator, prostacyclin. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is lethal and needs expert multidisciplinary management. If a patient has unexplained shortness of breath on exertion, you should at least consider pulmonary hypertension as a cause and assess for possible risk factors. An echocardiogram is a, reliable, uh, is a reasonable screening tool. Time to referral and definitive diagnosis is important. 
management is based around continuous follow-up and risk stratification. PAH is a rare disease, but the physiology can be more common in certain patient subgroups. If you're treating a chronic pulmonary hypertension patient in the acute setting, you should get expert help and consider transferring them to a tertiary center. You should never interrupt a prostacyclin infusion. Inhaled pulmonary vasodilators only improve oxygenation if they're short acting and you should avoid diet pills, dodgy supplements and bootleg cooking oil. This talk was partly inspired by the podcast and article on inhaled pulmonary vasodilators on the Internet Book of Critical Care. I'd encourage you to check it out. If you want a bit more depth and to hear from actual pulmonary hypertension physicians, check out the six part Medscape in discussion podcast on the topic. They also have written transcripts of all the episodes online. As always, check out Deranged Physiology. I also found this review article in the citations on the website. It's a bit old, but there was a nice overview. There's also a short post on nitric oxide on the resus me post with a dramatic case report. My main reference for the clinical elements, again, were the European guidelines I mentioned. I also referenced the European guidelines for PE and right heart failure management towards the end. There's a lot of books on pulmonary hypertension. This one's quite comprehensive with a good range of basic science to clinical conditions. Most of the intracellular smooth muscle signaling section is based on this book, which has just about all you'll ever want to know about vascular smooth muscle. I actually bought this one, it's pretty impressive. Uh, this is a quite nice book for more general ICU hemodynamic physiology, and it has a nice introduction with some simple fluid dynamics. Then there's Bromwald's heart disease, which had a very good pulmonary hypertension section with plenty of detail about pathogenesis. Finally, I'm just going to mention panvascular medicine, which is a tome. It is nearly 5,000 pages. They really tried to cover everything. Don't buy it. It costs a fortune. But if you're able to read it, check it out. It's quite impressive. Thank you for watching um, what turned out to be quite a long video. I hope you got something out of it. I spent over two and a half months working on this between work and definitely learned a lot. I have realized though that this is probably isn't the most efficient way to study and I think I'll focus on more bite-sized topics in future, although this should hopefully mean that I'll get shorter videos out more frequently.